I was uh, looking at some tweets here from today, and Gold Key said, Hey, guys, if you want to, you can send all of your sacrifice PLS to a burn address. And then Richard said, If you like, you can add your withdrawal address to a burn address and permanently bind them. Then any validating fees or withdrawing uh, will be burnt forever. So I knew about the buy and burn button, but is this some way to automate that? I, I'm no. not sure. Let me clear. Let me clarify. When you set up a validator, there's called a thing called a withdrawal address. When you're a validator, if you have more than 32 million PLS that you've been credited because you've earned that money, mm -hmm. the yeah. network will automatically give you that money to whatever withdrawal address that you give it. Uh -huh. For a regular community validator, that'll be a hardware wallet, Ethereum address in a protected account that hopefully you never have any contract risk, right? Mm -hmm. like that's where you should do. He's just saying that, oh, a validator- Wait, wait back up, say that again. Say, say that again, what kind of wallet do you have to have to do that? You should have a hardware wallet with the private keys on it so that your ETH address is protected and you probably shouldn't be doing DeFi with that wallet. You shouldn't be having contract risk with that wallet. It's very important. I hope everybody's taking notes. You cannot reassign that wallet once you've assigned it. Okay. And so, where, does your, where does the burn come in, though? So, <laughs> a validator, you sign that one time. You cannot change it. Incredibly important that that is a harbor wallet, ETH address, that you have protected. Maybe that's a single address on a single hardware wallet that you don't do anything other than get your withdrawal keys. Incredibly important. Also, the validator, if you exit it, can only go that, to, to that address. You cannot change it ever. Richard is just saying, oh, you could set that address to a burn address if you wanted to. There's a lot of validators in the network. I don't know. Oops, you know, like this is a thing that, that kind of exists. Isn't that sweet? It doesn't have anything to do with PulseX. It doesn't have anything to buy and burn feature. It's literally, you can set the withdrawal address to a burn address, or you could set it to, I don't know, the hardware wall that you control, and you're just putting it out there. And I think that's really cool because we don't have any expectations, but that there could be like the biggest whale in the system or the Poseidon that's it's using that as a way to, um, you know, adjust the interest rates and the inflation and the deflation and everything. Does anyone know if if Ethereum has such a mechanism enabled? I guess they could just set it to their own dead address. Yeah, Correct. Ethereum. Sorry, well, Walrus. Yeah, Ethereum validators could do the exact same thing if they wanted to yeah. do so. Yeah, just to add some clarity. So this isn't like a buy and burn function. Every address. So like on ETH, it's the address zero X and then full zeros, the rest, that's the burn address. And what it's not anything special. It's just an address that no one owes the key to. So it gets referred to as a burn address because anything you send there is burned. So it's done, gone, that's it, right? There's no way to have retrieval. So what that initial message from RH is talking about is essentially, wouldn't it be interesting if a huge group of validators didn't collect their rewards and just sent them to the burn address, which you could do anywhere. That's just a function you could do. It's not a suggestion for anyone else to do. And then gold key is just being funny. And his joke is like, hey, it would be really bullish for the rest of us if you guys all just burn your pulse because then it's out of the supply. So RH is describing a function uh, like the Gamma is describing where those where some people's validators, no expectations, could decide to basically give up their rewards and then gold keys being funny. So those are unrelated, nothing for anyone to actually do. For bridging, let's say I buy HSI, Hedron, um, NFT. Would I be able to bridge that over to Pulse Chain to maybe um, end the stake on that end? Would that be a possibility? or that wouldn't work so you have to have a bridge that is set up to actually make that function right so the original bridge um, there's a few different styles of bridges the short answer is no you can't do what you're asking so the way a bridge works it doesn't actually move the nft so like if you imagine you had the nft in your hand and it's on the eth network you, it doesn't actually move it over to the Pulse Chain network. What it does is it's own, it gives you a poker chip or a check. It's just a representation of that value on the other side. So you can't end the NFT or that wrap token because it's not the original token. So you would be able to, once there's a bridge that's able to move NFTs, you could move that NFT over to Pulse Chain. And then me, you, and Gamma, and everybody here, we could all sell that, that NFT around. So say it's like a 15-year HSI stake. You could move it to Pulse Chain, and then we could all sell it move it around um, for low fees and but eventually to actually cash it out you'd have to move it back to ethereum and then end stake there got it thank you it appears that pulse chain may be launching here soon and uh, everybody wants to know what their strategy is and 
what the latest is. Yeah, so I was thinking earlier, can you please elaborate and explain more about the buy and burn mechanism that uh, BuzzChain adopts? So the buy and burn come is actually PulseX. So the way it works is whenever you actually make a swap, part of that swap fee, there's a swap fee in every DEX. So you, most people don't notice it. It's less than a third of a percent. Um, and some of that fee gets sent to another contract. So this is like in the contract, they call this a fee scrape. So essentially imagine that that swap fee you pay, some of that goes to the people providing liquidity and then a small portion goes to another contract. So just in your head, imagine that you're swapping 10 USDC for something. Essentially, again, I'm just using round numbers to make it easy. You get $9.50 worth of whatever token. And then there's 50 cents, right? 40 cents go to the people providing liquidity. And another 10 cents goes to the buy and burn contract. So now there's 10 cents worth of value there. And every swap that happens, some of that fee gets scraped off and keeps going to that address. So imagine that everybody does this and then you end up with a, a contract that now has $8 in it, just for round numbers, okay? When someone goes and calls the buy and burn function, that $8 does exactly what it says, buy and burn. So it buys PLSX token off the market and then sends it to the burn address. So that helps the price of PulseX because you get buy pressure, right? So $8 buys, boop, 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 chart goes up a little bit. And then it takes those tokens and sends them to the burn address, which means that they can never be sold again. So what you have is a deflationary supply. So there's less supply for the same demand later on. And then you get the acute price action because there's a buy. So that buy and burn is positive in the two ways at one, it gets bought, price goes up a little bit, and then it gets burned so it can never be sold. Okay, I've got a question. Um, it hasn't really been talked about, but the uh, the native token. So um, how is that going to come into play with I mean, with PulseX? Why why would we need a native token if there's going to be PulseX? You're talking about incentive token to clarify for everyone. Sorry, yes, an, uh, incentive token. Sorry. Well, it's so that way the incentive. It's so that way people have a means of actually getting the token sold off as well. Because if you gave everyone the ability to just earn PLSX, like for example, Cake is a good example in this scenario. If all you did was farm and you just had cake, then you would have to sell cake in order to take profits. Well, how do you get people to hold on to the tokens for longer and still be able to earn profit? They need some sort of incentive token uh, so that way they can possibly earn some yield by providing liquidity and yield farming. And then also at the same time, um, not sell down the PLSX in this scenario in order to take profits. That's the main benefit of that. I mean, it just, it seems to me that, it, I mean, that could be like the white knight in the room. I mean, <laughs> we're talking about a whole nother coin that I mean, we don't even know what the price of that could be. I mean, that could be amazing to a lot of people. Isn't it also true that eventually when you get one-sided PLS uh, X staking, that you'll get an incentive token as well for taking your stuff off the market for a while? No, that's a little different. That one, you're going to be given a, we'll call it a reward token. And this scenario, it's called PRT from what we've seen in the past, it's the okay. Pulse Reward Token. It is different. So the way that works is we're going to have the ability to vote with the PLSX. Oh, go ahead. So what you're talking about is our third party tokens, like Liquid Loan has loan token. Uh, there's a Fetch, which is an Oracle platform, Fetch token. They can provide, like hypothetically speaking, they could put a million Fetch tokens in the PulseX pool. You put PulseX into a single side liquidity pool and you get the Fetch token out as like a reward. And that's your reward. The PRT was just a placeholder for test debt. So there's, those are actually a means, you know, for third party tokens. I mean, it could be like okay, any, so any platform, right? Uh, uh, the KG, right? The IM token on Pulse Chain or whatever. They could be a thing. So the incentive token is just for providing liquidity, actual liquidity, providing the incentive token. And that's separate from the single. Yeah, I mean, he's saying yeah, exactly what he's saying. So the incentive token is simply for providing liquidity and yield farming. The third party reward token is for single sided staking your PLSX. And if I recall correctly, there's not going to be a minimum number of days. It's just whatever you decide. And also that the third party token might be voted upon by a DAO of holders of PLSX, if I'm remembering correctly. That's correct. Okay, so then, then the incentive token is, 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 um, is there a number? Do we have a number for the circulating supply or is it just something created 
uh, for doing some work. One so ink, be... um, second is the is yeah. the issuance. So derive whatever you want from that. Shit, that sounds pretty damn valuable to me. Yeah. So the idea on that on that inside Tico is going again. It's to help incentivize pairs that you want to see. So you add you add that reward to pools that you want to see added liquidity, right? And then you can remove that incentive to try to thin it back out. So you apply it to all the main pairs in the system because you want to make sure that people are providing liquidity in those in those main pairs, PLSX, PLSX, probably PLSX hex, all these types of things. And then you can remove that if you ever need to thin it out. So it's it's again, it's designed to help the people that are providing liquidity. And then it will also, I can't remember if they did it on V4 or not, uh, but likely there'll also be extra incentive on pairs that include INC, such as PLS, INC, PLSX, INC. And that's a way to help buoy that value as well. So part of the part of the uh, value proposition of the INC token is that if you provide liquidity with it, that you can actually even yield even more of it. So there's a few kind of small gameplays there. But again, it's just meant to keep the ecosystem ha- happy on liquidity. It just seems amazing because if you think about it, that should mean that the tokens never leave your wallet, for one. So it's a single-sided staking. You're not trusting a third party. You're getting... Uh, because of the way PulseX is designed, it's becoming more valuable every day as it's bought and burnt. And then on top of that, you're being given a yield that you can decide when to go in and go out of, and you never harm this thing that's getting more valuable every day. It almost becomes like, why would anybody ever sell a PulseX, ever? It's a golden cash cow. So there's a little bit of a difference there. The INC only comes when you're providing liquidity. So that's not single-sided staking. Those are two different things. So how this would work is I want to provide liquidity for PLS, PLSX, right? That pair has an incentive on it. Okay, so I go put in a million and three million because usually it ends up at that one to three ratio. I go provide liquidity. Everything else is irrelevant. I'm just providing liquidity. You get back an LP token, okay? That's, that's the representation of liquidity you put in. Now you go and look and there's an INC farm. Okay, that's where that that incentive tokens. So since I'm providing liquidity, I can take that LP token I got and put it in the farm. And that's how I get the INC token. So those tokens had to leave your wallet. They're in a pool. You have impermanent loss. You're collecting uh, swap fees. Like again, the, you're providing liquidity there. This single sided staking is completely separate. It's an entirely different function. Single-sided staking is where you take PLSX and then you can actually stake it into any of these sponsored pools. And again, a third party has to put up that incentive. So XYZ token wants to get distribution. Again, as you said, the DAO votes on it. They're going to put up a bunch of Walrus tokens, right? So you take PLSX. It's not provided liquidity. There's no impermanent loss. There's no risk to that. You stake them in the the Walrus token pool and then you're going to get paid out Walrus tokens. And then what you do with them is up to you. And then eventually... However many tokens that player, that uh, that protocol, that entity puts up, when those run out, that pool ends, and you can you can do whatever you want with your tokens at that point. But there's no locking mechanic, and there's no um, other than again a very 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 minimal amount of essentially just smart contract risk. There's no there's no risk involved with single sided staking. So basically, if I understand correctly, the smart contract, if you trust the smart contract, then there's really no way for the liquidity pool that you're going into to rug you because the smart contract is designed to stop that okay they're they're two separate things single-sided staking is not a liquidity pool they're two different things a liquidity pool is the pairs that you see when you're making swaps okay if you go into a liquidity pool you put both of those sides of the token up so if you see if you're going and swapping usdc for hex there's people who have usdc and hex in that pair that's what those liquidity pools are right okay so you can't be rug but you have you there's movements that go on there that go along with liquidity. That's its yeah, own permanent function. loss. Impermanent Correct. Loss. Okay. So the single-sided staking is different. The single-sided staking works as, hey, I'm Walrus. I'm willing to pay people to just stake their PLSX. And essentially, the reason they would do that is it works like an airdrop. I just want my token out there. I want people to come participate, right? But yeah. if I airdrop, people may not see it. They may not know what it is. But if I put up the Walrus pool on PLSX, then people get to see it. They can read the DAO. They realize it's a token. Maybe they keep it. Maybe they don't. But they don't. They're not providing liquidity. All they're doing is staking their PLSX. Okay. And am I staking it with the um, with the third party token provider where they have custody of it? Nope. It's just locked in the PLSX contract. So you do not have exposure to the third party. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay. And I can leave anytime I want. Correct. That's awesome. That's just insanely awesome. If you want an example. 
example of this, you can you can go to PancakeSwap and uh-huh. you can look at the pools and you can actually go through and see where there's all these projects and some of the APYs. Uh, so PancakeSwap is a very, very similar mechanics. And then also Spooky, as in like, ooh, a ghost. Spooky Swap. Uh, you can look at both those protocols and people can look at the pools. They can look at the yield farms and they can even look at some of the Dow proposals and kind of see what they look like firsthand. So you're not just trying to envision all of it. Yeah, I remember a while back I went over to Phantom and, and looked on Spooky Swap and it was incredibly complex because you had to do these things and there were these epochs and then you had to dig it up and put it somewhere else. This sounds much simpler. So it, that stuff is essentially on the third party protocol. If without having to know, all you'll have to do is go to the tab, look through the pools. Essentially, unless you know anything about the project, you just want to look and see which APY is high. So you would look and see the, okay, the, the Maddie token is giving me, you know, 15%. The Walrus token is giving me seven. Okay, well, I don't want the Walrus token. I want the APY. I'm going to stay. I'm just going to click the pool, send my PLSX tokens to the Maddie token and collect the yield. The risk is in those meme coins, though, and in, in the yield farming, you know, because you, you gave an example of a stable coin coin well that you know it's it's not moving around but a meme coin you know could dump on you and you know if you put up the money to do the yield farm and you're making you've mentioned 15 percent. but if, it, if the coin dumps 30 percent, you basically you lost yes only if you're providing liquidity and single-sided staking you didn't cost anything all you had to do was allocate your pulse x so they're not at risk you don't lose anything so whatever value you pull out of the the tokens you can just sell them so if you sit here collecting the tokens, even if they go down in value, you're just going to sell them. You didn't co- they didn't cost you anything to acquire. So if they went down in value, you would just end up yielding less, but it doesn't cost you anything again because you're not providing liquidity. Gotcha. Thank you so much. This has nothing to do with security, but this has to do with just being smart. Be careful. And I know people are going to do this anyways, but I can't stress enough. Like, just be careful with the ratio trading because you will get wrecked. And I think a lot of people are going to wreck themselves attempting to do this when, 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 when it goes live. So I just wanted to say that just be careful with the ratios and, and trying to you know do your swaps and all that stuff. That's great advice. Thanks for sh- sharing that. To the same point that I think that was James talking, that's a good one to call out. Besides just ratios is the liquidity will be thin. Most of the time, especially if you're a more average size player, you're not used to having to check slippage. You do need to check slippage. Confirm, make sure that ratio makes sense in your head. Um, again, everyone will be on a rush. You're not going to have US dollar values to sort of be a crutch, which is what a lot of us look, look at. Uh, so again, all these things, it, it's fun. It's exciting. There's gonna be a lot of money to be made, but there'll be a lot of people who make big mistakes. Yeah. So just, take just sit time. back and watch, man. I, I just, I would just, rec- I would just give the advice to just sit back and just, just let this shit just do what it does. Another thing too, since we're on, since we're talking about security, um, this thing, when it goes and you guys are going to have coins in your, in your wallet, don't be at freaking cafes and internet spots and Wi-Fi spots opening up your MetaMask and that shit. You guys got to be vigilant and just do that always on a on a closed Wi-Fi network. Don't be doing stupid crap like that because there's there's going to be thieves everywhere jumping on this. I w- yeah, I definitely appreciate you saying that. And people need to be really careful when they're connecting at hotels and cafes and any public Wi-Fi. Yeah, that's the really yeah. dangerous. And one thing. Be careful, especially if you're in France. France, Belgium. Belgium, all the European countries, Romania. There's there are groups out there that they that's what they do. So if you got you got to be careful. Got to be vigilant. And one thing, sure. did you hear me about the pulse ramp? Yeah, that's really exciting. So cool. pulse ramp is the uh, the bridge, I guess, that Richard is launching that'll be associated with pulse chain. Yeah, yeah, it's it's officially down right now. So I think James, please, can you elaborate more? What do you mean by the bridge? So the bridge, so the the bridge pulseramp.com is the the website is down right now. So essentially, it it it, it indicates that he's he's probably like FTPing in the live version. Or oh, something. okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So I just wanted to comment. Pulse ramp is on V4. V4 is still a thing. V4 is still alive. If there's a problem with pulse ramp, V4 pulse ramp is still a thing. It will still exist. So people are saying, "Oh my God, pulse ramp is going offline. It'll come back. Calm down." Because I think. There was uh, there was something written that says if you don't if you don't see this text anymore, that's an indicator of being the mainnet. And if it's on the same domain name, that means that you're gonna switch there, right? A text. 
if you know what I'm talking about. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. So it's because it's the same domain, right? Mainnet bridge operations not going to be 24 or 48 hours, right? That's the expectation. That's what it's been put out there. It's not going to happen before mainnet goes live. It happens a couple of days after mainnet goes live. Just to throw that out there. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, that's how it's always been discussed theoretically. So, um, and I, I wasn't sure if we know of any technical limitation to uh, the idea that only hex and pulse chain and pulse X get ratio traded at first versus all the PRC 20s are able to be ratio traded on the chain. I don't know if Gamma or if anybody else is aware of, of that possibility. The liquidity, the NM bot will harvest tokens and then tokens will be deployed in the Pulsex before you have access to it. That's a very well-known thing. And it's not just like a couple tokens. It's like a few, there's no list, but you could look on V4 and see what happened on V4, which which assets have liquidity. Perhaps there's a clue there. Do we so, know if, if there are any clues about whether like FixerBot runs in the public or whether it runs in the private? It runs in private before you have access to it. So ratio trading is the exact same. So if you look at the PulseX code, the Uniswap code, the Pulse Chain code, the Ethereum code, all these things, none of them know, none of that code knows what a dollar is. So the fact that there's not dollar values changes nothing about what happens on chain. That dollar value that we see is a use is a UI. It's part of the user experience. The code knows none of those things. So when we're ratio trading, we're ratio trading right now. Every trade you do is a ratio. So when you swap USDC for hex, you didn't swap five hundred dollars. You swapped. 500 of an ERC20 that just has a hash for another ERC20 that just has a hash at this at this ratio. Uniswap doesn't know that your monkey brain thinks that USDC is a dollar. So ratio trading, we're just trying to describe, hey, you're not going to have these dollar value uh, there that we usually use as, as, as like a crutch to make these trades and make them make sense to us. But nothing about the code on chain is different. It's just swapping, just trading, just pulse X, just the way it would be after the dollars. We just don't have that dollar value there to see. Do we know if there's any like um, time frame in between? Because I know people talk about snapshot, fork, and this and that. But do we know, is is there going to be a gap of time between, because FixerBot's running in private, is there a, a day or two days of gap between the Ethereum blockchain as we know it now and what Pulse Chain will be in terms of like the history there, of who owns this the is coin? A, this is a technical thing, very easy to answer. Ethereum chugs along every 12 seconds. A block height is picked, it's assigned. Now code has to be ran. Now Pulse Chain lives from that block height going forward and it takes time to roll out the launching of Pulse Chain, the booting up of nodes, then you have the AMM bot, fixer bot, right? Like all that has to happen. So there is an, a there's a time delay. There has to be between the block height of the fork and then you actually getting access to the RPC settings and be able to do anything on it. Like how long is that? Not gonna say, but it's a some term it's some interval of time and we'll see what it is on mainnet. Awesome. That's much more clear now. That's what I thought.